Welcome to the Innovation Room. This is a podcast where we get to sit down with the researchers, authors, thought leaders, and innovators to dig into the whole wide world of innovation. We talk about tools, strategies, tactics, and how we can improve our innovation performance. I'm Colin Nelson. I'm your host of a new series of podcasts brought to you by Hype Innovation. And we're going to be focusing on thought leaders for the next series, bringing some of the brightest brains, the authors that you know and love, to talk about their work in innovation and the innovation field. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by John Besson. Most of you will have heard of John. You may have read his textbooks. He doesn't really require an awful lot of introduction, but those of you who don't know, he's Emeritus Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Exeter, whilst also teaching in the places like Norway and Germany. He's been in the field for many, many years, having written over 40 books and monographs, having acted as an advisor to national governments, international bodies like the UN and the World Bank, as well as advising regular commercial companies. Some of the topics that you may remember are things like managing innovation, which is now in its eighth edition. And perhaps newer books that you may not have seen recently are Creativity for Innovation Management. That was brought out just last year. I can't wait to get into the topic of innovation with John. We've known each other for many years, so without any further ado, John Besson. So welcome, John. Welcome to the Innovation Room. Delighted to have you with us and can't wait to talk a little bit about innovation and and your career and and where we see the future. Um, How are you today? I'm doing very well, Colin. For once, it's a sunny day here in Devon. It's not normally that way, but uh, that's the reason it's so green in this county. But anyway, it's sunny today, so I'm doing well. It's a beautiful part of the world. I'm very jealous that that's where you are. (laughs) It's not so sunny here. Um, So let's get started with your background in your career. Now, John, you and I have known each other for for quite a long time. I think we ran into each other in in Amsterdam once upon a time. Uh, And we we talk innovation from time to time. And we've been operating in this field for a while. But what I I perhaps I don't know is is how you got into the innovation field in the first place. How how did you find yourself into this into this position? (laughs) That's a great question. Um, A combination of accident and frustration, if you like. Um, Once upon a time, I was an engineer. So I trained as a chemical engineer. And uh, that's what I was doing, working in the chemical industry. Um, And my old boss um, got in touch with me, old university boss. And he said, did I fancy doing a PhD, but a different kind of PhD? I thought PhDs, you sat in a lab and you did lots of experiments. And it wasn't me. But he said, no, 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 this is all about trying to understand how innovation works by actually doing it in a company. So basically, I got a job working as an engineer in a chemical company uh, with the remit to, on the side of that actual work, uh, looking at how innovation happened and how it could be improved. Now, this was way back. This was the sort of mid 70s. So we're talking a, a long way. And the innovation field wasn't necessarily as advanced as it is today. Um, so a lot of people really had no idea. And so this was a kind of a, a barefoot experiment. So I got kind of thrown in the deep end. And um, and the frustration was my sense that even though I was working before that in big companies, we didn't quite get the hang of this innovation thing. We didn't fail, but things could have been faster. The products could have been better for the market. The process changes could have been better. So all these sort of things that we know about in innovation were frustrating me. And so this this gave me an opportunity to study it. And I loved it. I had three years. I think I enthused quite a lot of people on the site. It was up in Scotland. I were about a thousand people on site. And they gradually got enthused by the project. They too were interested. And so we had great fun. I think we changed a few things in the right direction, but it gave me a taste for it. And perhaps the other thing was I was very lucky to ride a technical wave. You know, we get these periodic revolutions. This was the days of the microelectronics revolution. They just started using this technology big time. And people were talking just like today they talk about AI. You know, microelectronics was going to change the world. Um, And not everybody understood how that worked as an innovation I'd had direct experience and uh, that helped me sort of build a research career in the university. But I suppose the the last part of the question is I, I, um, I've never really felt I was a sort of traditional university person. Um, I like to research so I understand things better, but my lab is the real world. And uh, I like to try the ideas out and, and learn from and with the real world. But that's where it came from. So I'm asking you a question, given there wasn't the sort of standardized approaches that perhaps we consider to be commonplace now and uh, innovation you know, in terms of its level of maturity was in a very, very different place. How did you judge what good looked like? Um, how was it 
how, how did you get to a point where you could say, you know, this is a good practice, this is a good way of doing things, and this is something we should move away from? But what was that sort of thought process like? Uh, well, very interesting. When, when I was doing the research particularly, it, it, it was um, the kind of frustrations I felt reflected in others. You know, people felt, hey, we could do better. Now, you can put metrics around it, like how long did it take for us to get a new product to the market? And when it got there, was it the one that the market actually wanted? Well, that's a fairly straight measure. Or the bit that I was particularly engaged in uh, was um, process change, uh, introducing microelectronics, new technologies, um, and getting them accepted. And of course, you can imagine the shop floor weren't too keen on technology that potentially changed their skills, could at the limit put them out of work. So, so these kinds of things, you realize, yeah, success is um, it's very much about bringing the organization with you. It's very much about the, 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 the kind of feeling of confidence. Yes, we're doing this right and we've learned to do it rather than that feeling of frustration. So, uh, yes, you can stick some sort of nice, neat metrics on it, but I've always felt the innovation story was a little more complex than that and very much more human. And much more interesting, right? Much more nuanced according to the nature of an industry, a culture, a set of objectives that an organization has. It isn't as simple as simple as one standardized approach that everybody can just copy, which makes it much more um, interesting and creative in terms of working out what's the right fit for a particular organization. So um, at what point did you transition to more formal teaching and writing on the subject? Uh, well, I finished my PhD um and then was looking for work. And the fairly traditional route was to take a research fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship. And as I said, this electronics thing was really beginning to take off. So I got funded by the Department of Trade and Industry when we used to have one of those, but essentially that was the government department uh, trying to look at the impact of microelectronics across different sectors. And it was a, a great job because I visited lots of different firms, all shapes and sizes across many different sectors uh, to understand what the potential was and to talk to lots of managers about their concerns about how do we use this? How do we introduce it? Back to those sort of human questions. Um, how can we get the benefit from it? Um, and that was also fun. Um, I've already branched into consulting as well. Uh, I, uh, I worked for a while. There was a government scheme to promote the take up of this technology. Um, and it was a classic example. Industry felt, yeah, we probably should do something about it, but we don't really want to take the risk. And government said, OK, we'll give you some cash to explore. We'll fund the feasibility study. And I uh, teamed up with a, a startup at the university to, um, uh, they, they were electronics engineers and I was the kind of technical sales. But we go to companies and say, look, the government will pay you to explore. You've got nothing to lose. But it was a way of sort of bridging the innovation gap. And that's very often for universities a problem. They've got the knowledge, but it's hard to bridge it across. So maybe uh, just a slight sidebar, because I think this is an interesting subject in terms of when we're introducing new processes, new technologies. I see two very different worlds, and I'm interested what it was like when you first started. On one end of the scale, we see organizations introduce new ways of working, new ways of new technologies, purely for growth. You know, their ambition is to grow better in the commercial world. We want more profit. We want to grow faster. But at the other end of the scale, we see organizations um, automating, introducing new technologies to be more efficient. And there's always this interesting conversation with, with, with companies, you know, when they talk about innovation, do they consider it to be product and capability and business model, or do they consider it to be something they care about in the realms of efficiency? Back then, when it was in the, in the microelectronics zone, what was the, what was the angle of attack? Was it, was it automation and taking cost out, or did people have a bigger vision? Uh, it varied. Um, innovation, as you rightly said, for me, has always been a matter of do better do what we already do better, which is your efficiency story, but you can do it inside the products. You're not inventing new to the world. You can just, the Mark II, the Mark III. So that's the kind of efficiency, doing better and doing different. Mm. And of course, what electronics opened up was masses of scope for productivity improvements, efficiency gains, of course, particularly getting tighter control. That's what it was very good at. But at the same time, it made possible things that just hadn't been possible before. And that really was quite challenging. And there were some visionary companies who thought yeah we've been in this game a long time doing it the analog way wow what could we do with a digital thing mm -hmm. but we've got to educate our market as well so even back then i think that was very clear that um it's not it is a tension if it's competing for resources but the smarter companies have a sort of a, a sort of a, a portfolio approach that says well we'll do a lot of doing things better that's going to keep us afloat but let's also try the different stuff and yeah and get the balance right 
I think it's a really interesting observation. And you're absolutely right. When it's competing for resources, then of course there's going to be some degree of conflict, or we're treading on each other's toes. We see these very traditional industries where the worlds of continuous improvement and innovation maybe are indeed kept very far apart. And when you sort of start talking about the fact that potentially the things we're talking about can benefit everybody, that can be a degree of conflict simply because the organization's not structured well to, to adopt these, these sorts of yeah. things. Yeah. And what we see is in the more progressive space is that to start to see actually, well, doing better is, is, is something that we can all, we can all learn from irrespective of the scale and magnitude and where we're focusing. So I think that, that really, really hits home for me. So you've, you've done, you've done an awful lot in your career. You've, you've taught, you've, you've written, you've consulted, you've done a advise you work to, to governments and, and other institutions, which bits of the work do you enjoy the most? What, what gives you the most pleasure? That's a great question. Um, I think I could crystallise it. It's enabling learning. Now, that's much more than teaching because, as I've implied, I, I see my laboratory, my, my space as much more than just the classroom. I, I think it's helping people to learn about innovation and that's a selfish motivation. It was helping me learn. And I still enjoy the fact that when I try and explain it to someone else, I understand it better. But yeah, I'd, I'd loosely characterize it as enabling learning. Um, and the bits I've enjoyed most is the uh, the non-traditional. You know, it's, it's OK teaching a bunch of students or an MBA class, but um, taking a group of people who perhaps have never even thought about innovation and giving them language and everything, giving them an appropriate language, giving them relevant concepts, translating what I've learned in other things. That's been enormously rewarding and exciting. Um, and the other, I suppose, is, is, is getting um, practitioners together. I'm a great believer in peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think um, learning networks, whatever you call them, uh, people challenge each other. You, you, you can't fudge it. You know, If you're doing something not very well, someone else will call you out in that kind of environment. So that shared peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, I love facilitating that. I, I, and I, I get a lot from it. So that's interesting. I always, um, I often find that organizations fall into different categories when it comes to innovation maturity. And it's mm. usually heavily connected to how important it's been in the past for them to change and reinvent themselves. So certain industries, they constantly have to change, otherwise they will die due to competitive pressures or whatever. But I agree with you completely. Every organization innovates to a greater or lesser extent. And of course, where they can improve innovation performance may vary. But what's interesting, and I've, I've seen this myself, is that when the organizations that are coming to this, you know, perhaps at a lower level of experience, perhaps a services type organization that's pretty much been the same for over hundred years, tries to learn from an organization where they've had the innovation, the DNA, their ability to change and metamorphosize themselves into different yeah. directions. I think that's where the magic happens because you say, actually, many of the things that you're grappling with have actually been wrestled with before, but just from a different perspective. And that, that sounds like that, that's, what, that's what you enjoy. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think there's a there's an element of uh, there's this character in a lot of Shakespeare plays called the fool, and and the fool is the one who can call the king out. You say, look, that was a really silly thing to do, Your Majesty. Anybody else, you get your head chopped off. But the fool is kind of licensed to play that role, and in some ways, I quite like that because I can, um, from where I come from, help people learn, but also occasionally challenge them. You know, poke a stick at them, and so and. Back to what you just said, I, I think there's there's a kind of two-step thing. There's the organizations who don't know and haven't really thought about innovation. Step one is to step think about it and, and, and routinize it. You know, say, what, what have we learned so far? Um, and that's already a big step, just to learn the capability. But the really smart ones are the ones that continuously challenge themselves and say, yeah, it might have been right then, but is it still right what do we have to change? And and that, for me, back to your point about maturity, that's where I see the really mature players, the ones who do take the time, give themselves the space, confront themselves to change. Well, that leads me on to my next question, really, which is really about how, what, are, what maybe the biggest challenges have been in supporting this industry to develop, um, to, to mature, to get more effective in terms of translating uh, best practice from one place to another. Um, what have you been the sort of biggest hurdles you think you've, you've witnessed over your career in terms of modernizing this industry and helping support innovators to learn better? Oh, that's another great question. Um, so much is embedded in the, um, the, the dynamic of, you know, we've got to perform. So mm -hmm. if it works fine, let's just keep going. You know? So the, the number one is taking the time out to think about it differently uh, and being motivated to do that. Um, 
And that's hard to do unless it's a really pressing general challenge. So when we had, for example, the challenge of lean, now that's a long time ago. Lean was a revolution. Lean said, actually, it's not all about technology. It's about the way you organize and think about this whole thing. Ah, now that really was big. But for organizations to take the time out to see that it was only when everybody was going lean that that momentum was built. And the same with uh, some of the uh, the discontinuous innovation, the fact that just from time to time, you will get upstaged by something uh, big and um, not on your current trajectory. It's only when you get to that kind of um, critical mass of people talking about it that organizations get away from doing what they've uh, traditionally done. They, they, they jump the tracks rather than stay on the same trajectory. Well, that, that implies a different question, which is the role of the visionary leader, somebody who has the imagination to support that organization to shift uh, mm -hmm. rather than just waiting for the masses to adopt it and just being Absolutely. like someone else. Um, is that what you saw as being the um, the driving force for that shift, that, that, that those that were, did have the vision that could get ahead of everybody else could then drag everybody else forward with them? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's back to um, having the 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 position to challenge the organization but the internal credibility to do so and um successfully um you know any number of consultants any number of academics whatever can sort of hammer on the door and say you should be thinking about but you know, it's easy to defend against that it's much more uh, effective when there is somebody on the inside uh, i had a great privilege to work with a, a big german company and uh, write their innovation history and uh, that was a wonderful experience but Without question, one of the things that had helped enormously was their uh, uh, chief executive, who also was partly the owner of the company. That doesn't hurt. But he'd moved away from the operations. There was a great COO, so the things were running very well. But he saw increasingly his role as being the, just that, the challenger, the, the, the one who's got the time, space, breadth to be visionary and to bring those challenges in. Not to railroad them, but to set up the conversations, the um, the debates, if you like. I, I found that very, very interesting. And for me, that's real innovation leadership. Yeah. It's this sort of conflict, isn't it, between the organizations that feel like they have to uh, maintain the status quo and they can't really quantify the cost of standing still. And so um, they just stand still because for lack of it, another idea. And then there's other leaders who sort of see their responsibility to protect the future of the organization, to prepare it for what's coming, uh, whatever that might be. And that actually leads me into my next topic. You're the first person I ever heard talk about this, this concept of dynamic capability. In fact, it's probably a John Besson uh, a trademark. Um, um, and 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 I always been fascinated by this ability for an organization to try and build in agility by design to be flexible and amorphous depending on what sort of scenarios presented themselves. Maybe you could to talk about this this concept a little bit because I think that's one of the biggest changes over the last sort of ten to twenty years is this desire to be a bit more agile from a business sense. For the people that don't know, what is dynamic capability and how does it manifest itself within organizations? <laughs> Great. Um, I wish I had trademarked the label. That would have done me very well. But no, the, the, the label originally came from work by David Teese and others. Um, but for me, it's very, very simply what I said a moment ago. It's about innovation is important. We need to learn how to do it. There is a, a set of things we can learn to do. We've got to contextualize it. We can build a capability. So that's the capability. The dynamic capability element for me is that ability to step back um, and reset. It's a bit like your central heating control. You know, when it's hot outside, you turn it down. When it's cold, you turn it. But you need that ability to step back and reset. And it might be fine tuning. Occasionally, it might be a major shift. Uh, the, the, the textbook example literally would be Procter & Gamble's shift after 150 years of doing good R&D and good market research. They flipped to what they called connect and develop which was their open innovation label long before that was really a big fashion. But that was a fundamental rethink and it took them 20 years to work it through. Uh, but that's, that's dynamic capability. And it's the stepping back, reviewing, resetting in a changing world. Yeah, I, I remember um, Connect and Develop being uh, on the radar when it was established. 
and I've seen sort of these various iterations with the different organizations uh, as they have tried to learn from that thinking. And one of the observations I have is there's been a shift away from thinking we have to own everything inside the company. Um, you know, once upon a time, it was all about how much IP can we generate and hold on to. And I'm starting to see an attitude shift, which is we need to be fast. We need to be dynamic. And that means being a bit smarter in terms of how we deal with the outside world and maybe co-creating with a with an interesting emerging company rather than building it ourselves. But of course, not every organization is organized in such a way like P&G had to become to, to take advantage of that, to be able to really drive it through. Yeah. Um, but you're seeing that same trend, I guess, which is this move towards we need to be smarter with our value chain in terms of creating new capabilities, plus owning everything inside. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and in a sense, I've been in this game quite a long time, as you said, and uh, I've seen some shifts. Without question, in the early days, we were very much the firm at the center of things. Mm. And then we realized, actually, you've got to play with other players. So key partners, key suppliers, key customers, that kind of discussion. Uh, what's transformed in, I think, the 21st century and is accelerating is this networked model that actually it is about well, how often have you heard we need to build an ecosystem that isn't about one player. It's about mutual dependencies. And it's hard to manage because you don't control that. You can work with it. Um, so um, we, we've got a new book coming out about scaling innovation. And, and, and the big challenge there is you don't scale all on your own. Well, just like you don't climb Mount Everest on your own. You've got to partner up. And some of those partners will want to get in there with you because they're going in the same direction. Others you might need to get on board who have very different views. You've got to work at those relationships. But it's, yes, I agree entirely. I think it's about building shared value across ecosystem or across networks creating an ecosystem i want to come on to the topic of where you think well the biggest challenges are for the innovation industry are moving forward but before i do so there's, there's a, a connecting piece of tissue that i want to kind of try and thread between the stuff we just talked about and where we're going and i wanted to ask you the question about the role and the agenda of becoming more sustainable uh in helping change attitudes to innovation and I, i'm going to try and illustrate this with an example uh, when i talk to different ends of a value chain different members of an ecosystem what i see is you know the consumer putting pressure on the consumer products co goods company to to be more sustainable to have a a product a thing that can, product that can be recycled and, and and is part of a circular economy perhaps and that ripples down the value chain as organizations change what they sell but one of the observations I have, and I'm sure you share this, is that it's very slow. Mm -hmm. So if we have this waterfall approach to adapting what we do um, to help you know, improve our sustainability credentials, it might take five, 10 years to get from one end to the other. And some of the conversations that I'm starting to see emerging around that network ecosystem is, is there a better way? Could we actually bring both ends of the value chain together in some way in order to try and accelerate our shift towards a more sustainable future? So this is my sort of long rambling way of asking, to what extent do you think that sustainability is, 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 is driving that push towards ecosystems and where do you think that is in, it, in, in its development? Uh, it's a great question and, and, and a really important one. Uh, we did some work a, a few years back for the Network for Business Sustainability. It's a Canadian outfit, a lot of companies. But basically, they were asking us, so what do we know about sustainability and innovation? And, and we came up with a framework which resonated quite well. Level one is the do what you do better. It's optimization. You're crazy if you don't do that because it's going to save you money. Save energy, you save money. So it's kind of a no-brainer. Step two is the bit that a lot of smarter organizations get, which is, yeah, we could change our products and services, what we offer, and build businesses out of that. And there's firm level advantage to doing that. Where the big gains come, but where the challenges come, as you said, is at that system level, bringing the different players together. Um, and it's really hard to do. I think that's the challenge. That's why it does take a long time. Um, I think you're right. One of the problems is we don't really have so many tools to help us even think in system terms. Um, I remember way back when I studied engineering, systems thinking is a particular mindset, which is seeing all the bits and how they interact. In, in a chemical plant, you don't want to waste heat. If you've spent a lot of money and energy heating something up, think, where can I use that heat? Where can I plug it in elsewhere? This kind of systemic thinking um, is what we need. Um, if you can then configure the ways in which you get some of those key players together and have them co-create a better system level solution, that's exciting. 
but then you've got to convene that mm. you've got to um back to some of our work on shared value in networks you've got to demonstrate a piece of a benefit a piece of value for everyone who's going to play in that and whilst the optimist in me would like to say it's for the good of the future and our children the fact is businesses are to some extent quite selfish and so getting that bigger system level thing seeing the emergent properties we need it it has been and can be done but we still need quite a lot more tools to help us do it yeah, I agree. I think it's not there yet in terms of uh, the, the process knowledge and the systems thinking. You're absolutely right. There are little slices of, of, of emerging good practice here and there, but it, it's certainly a long way from the consciousness. Um, I really liked your, um, your your analogy with the heating uh, point. Mm. I've seen organizations that, that have, there are conglomerates and in one part of the business, they're generating heat and the other part of the business, they need heat. But the, the factory is associated with a 50 miles apart, right? That they, they were never thought to actually bring these things together to be more uh, to optimize that aspect and but it's it's the sustainability agenda that's making them think differently now and um, I'm just fascinated to see where that goes so we talked about sustainability is one of the bigger challenges that the organization is grappling with what are the other big themes that you think you know if you project out the next five ten years that this is an industry has to deal with in order to progress this next level um well the the, the huge one which uh, is 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 is, is... I think still in its infancy in terms of our understanding, but is going to have a huge impact is AI. Yeah. Um, I can remember again, back to, I've been in this a long time. I can remember a pre internet world of innovation and it didn't happen overnight. You know, the fact that we could join things together and call it the internet didn't mean that we were using those tools for probably 10 years you know, to use them well to the point where now the kind of collaboration platforms and networks and so on are core to the toolkit that takes time i think we're in the same space with ai i think ai has got enormous possibilities um but we really underestimate how fast that's changing um we probably underestimate how much we could configure it to point into we're kind of letting it happen to us to some extent and i think we could be a little more proactive mm. but, um, but I think that's going to be a really big one and it will change the way we approach innovation. Um, the optimist in me wants to see it very much as as a co-pilot that it mm. really sits in the cabin with you and you can really get a lot of help from it. But you're still at the controls. You're still setting the destination. So. Mm. But yeah, AI would be one for sure. It's, it's interesting. I see a lot of organizations struggling with a lack of data scientists. You know, they, they struggle with getting the people in-house to be able to understand what this could be for a particular business. There just isn't the quantity of skills. All the people that are out there are very expensive and they can't quite compete with the Googles of this world for hiring. I think that's a, a big big shift that's going to um, need to be addressed before we can fully take advantage of, of, of that as an area. One other topic that I think is interesting that keeps coming up time and time again in my world, and, and I appreciate your feedback on this, is is I see an ongoing disconnect between executive leaders and, and, and innovators on a common language for innovation. And frankly speaking, the, the you know the CEO or the COO will say, "Hey, you know, when I did my MBA, innovation was not part of the of the, of the package." And um, you know, what I care about is money, money in, money out, and time. How quickly can I get to that money? And then I speak to my innovators that give me all kinds of stuff I simply don't understand, and we don't have that common language. And then I talk to the corporate innovators, and the innovators will say, "Oh, those those guys up there, they don't understand innovation. They keep telling me I should be meeting this target or that target. It's kind of irrelevant in my world." I see this as a big, big area that in terms of the industry maturing. I was just interested in your experiences in that zone and where you think perhaps we can take some lessons to do better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's been with me from the very beginning. I, I think the, the, part of the challenge is everybody, to take 10 people, you'll get 11 definitions of innovation. That That's part of the problem. And uh, I suppose if I've done, achieved one thing, it's to simplify what would have been a, a paragraph long definition when I started to a one liner now. I mean, for me, innovation is creating value from ideas, commercial or social. But yeah. um, but that whole the way in which innovation happens, the, 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 the different perspectives, I think you're absolutely right. That's a big part of the problem. And uh, we've got a, a, a table in our textbook, which is if people only see innovation as this, then you're going to get these problems. And there's a whole table full of them. You know, and the, and it's it's partial models. There's none of them that are wrong. 
what we need is this kind of uh, integrated view of what is innovation and that's uh, yeah it is language it's it, it's an education thing really it, it it's um which is back to my point about <laughs> i see a role as enabling that learning but I, I do think it's a big challenge um i think sometimes um we'd almost <laughs> do better without the the, the label sometimes you know, to actually yeah. Talk about what it does rather than what you call it. Completely agree. I mean, in fact, one of the first questions I usually do is say, let's put innovation to one side. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to make better than it is today? And let's talk about real things rather than badges and labels, which are incredibly subjective. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think leadership um, struggle with that. They have a picture in their mind about what innovation is, which may or may not be true and may or may not be true in combination with the people that follow them. So that's a, that's a big wrestling point. Um, John, this has been an absolute pleasure. If they want to learn more about your work and your writing where where can the folks find you what's the best place for them to discover more about john besson um probably my website uh, i can give you the link but uh, uh, i think my kids educated me quite early on that uh, dad people don't read books anymore but they do visit websites and they watch them. so yeah the website would be fine fantastic fantastic well it's been a pleasure to speak with you thank you so so much for, for coming on the innovation room and uh, yeah look forward to speaking to you again in the near future that's been really interesting thanks so much colin so I'd like to thank John Bessent again for joining us and spending his time talking about his career in the innovation industry and how he sees things moving forward. If you want to learn more about John's work, you can follow his website. That's https colon forward slash forward slash johnbesson.org. We'll put it in the show notes as well for you to take a look at. If you've enjoyed this podcast, this is the first one of a series with innovation thought leaders. There'll be more coming next week. Like, subscribe give us a follow and you will always get to hear the innovation room um, it will come available to you on all the normal podcast channels like spotify itunes you name it looking forward to being with you again and talking innovation again in the very near future